stand together and turn to hymn number 404, the solid rock. 404. <laughs> Father, thank you for this time that you've given us. Well, 
beautiful day in June to come into your house to be with your people. I pray that you would give us wisdom and to know how to act in a way that will honor you and glorify you. Thank you. We can be here together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Turn to hymn number 470, Footsteps of Jesus, 470.
morning. Good morning. Would you please stand with me and turn to your copy of God's Word as, and follow along with me as I read from uh, Psalms 1. <clears throat> Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prosper. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff, that the wind blows away, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Please be seated. And then uh, while you're looking, go ahead and mark Revelation chapter 3. Well, we'll be back there later. So put your marker there or something. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. But the path of the just is a shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that we can come to, where we can learn. Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit that directs your word to our hearts. And I pray this morning, Lord, that our hearts are prepared. We're open to what you have for us, Father. And we confess that nothing's going to happen if you don't do it. 
So we praise you for that and glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning, it, uh, <laughs> that, uh, well, scriptures you read, brother, <laughs> it's either this and it's this. And amazingly, what I'm going to get into here, we're going to see, ideally, in the Christian life, it's either this or this. So I never realized that Job was pointed that much. That was great uh, to read that. Romans says we are to be conformed to the image of Christ. And that's the whole point of everything this morning is how he looks in this and how he wants us to come out looking. And so ideally, uh, some of this will help us to get there. I don't believe that you're going to hear anything new this morning. Uh, I'm not sure that I want it to be moved to, but it's the word of God and I want it to take it to our heart if we never have before. I know uh, I was, uh, had read a, read a thing on prayer some years ago, and I know I read it because I mark, when I'm reading things, I mark, uh, you know, as the Lord speaks to me and go down through there. And I found that this uh, particular article, uh, just the other day I started reading it again. I said, man, this is great stuff. And as I got into it, I found out I hadn't read it already. Uh, some years ago, I'm not sure how long ago, and you know what? If you'd asked me if I'd read that, I said no, not at all. So sometime, I'm not going to say it's getting older. When I start getting older, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it may be some of that too. <laughs> but it's there anyway. Sometimes things bear repeating, and so I ended this morning. This will and this will help you along. So. The whole thing is a path of growing to the likeness of Christ. The Lord says it over and over. Romans just got through saying it. And but too often Christians are not walking that path. And I call it the path of maturity. For right now, life for better term, we're going to see there's a couple more we can use. But it's just maturity in Christ. A simple, simple thing to say, but really difficult to do sometimes. One guy wrote, God is not honored by our arrested development. The New Testament teaches that we should go, go on to full maturity, that mediocrity is not the highest that Jesus offers. Now that's another word we can use besides maturity or immaturity, or, uh, immaturity is mediocrity. It's a little, kind of a different form, but maybe that's a, that's a place that a lot of Christians are in this level of mediocrity. Now we're going to see later that Jesus has a far different term for it. It's called lukewarm. It's not near as nice a term as mediocrity. But that's what we're talking about that, about this morning going there. So let's look at immaturity a little bit. Not going to get way deep into it. I don't think we're going to have to. Maybe bring some things uh, back to your remembrance in the process. But let's look at it a little bit. Immaturity is staying where one is. It's not growing. I mean, you, I could use a child for an example. Of course, it's very easy to do. Uh, can you imagine a child never growing up, staying right there? Can you imagine a Christian doing the same thing? Immaturity, staying where he is, no growth. It means not being where we should be. So there's a lot of things you can say about it. For instance, new believers, and I'm, I'm talking about people now that are old, when they got saved, they were old enough for this to take place. New believers usually have some growth immediately. Now, I'm, I'm of course talking about at least a teenager, a young person that has, has been around a little bit, older people, I was 30 when I got saved. So it's not, I can't identify with a younger person being saved and what they go through just by what some people have told me. But most generally, when a person is a little bit older and they get saved, there's some immediate signings of that. Now, they may not stay there very long. They may slow down. I had a friend who got saved the same I did, the same time I did, about the same age, and we took off and running after the Lord and working and doing everything we could, and in about six months, something happened in his family. He stopped. He never come back to church again. Talked to him. Completely turned away. I believe the guy was saved uh, because of what happened after he first got saved, but he's one of those that got stopped dead in his tracks. And I think there's too many people that get saved and that happens and they start just kind of slowing down for some reason. I have never really figured that out yet. But they start slowing down. Maybe it's like the teaching. I'm not sure. But it's just, there's no impetus there for them to keep on it. And they eventually, they're just the same year after year. And they, they blend in with the other people in the church, which is, you understand what I'm saying. That's a shame to 
be able to say that, but that's generally the case that maybe that's part of it, just kind of being like those that are around you, fitting in. I know that I probably use this for example because it's such a good example is uh, working the school there in Buffalo and seeing the teachers and everybody around there. And they all, is, if you believe what's said, and I'm not saying here or no, if you believe what's said, every teacher in elementary school at Buffalo is saved. They're all saved. They all respond to Christian things the same. They go to different churches, but they're all the same kind of churches. And when they get together, they're, everything is, is the same. The Lord's spoken of exactly the same. Nothing different, nothing up or down. They, when they're not together, just during the, day, during the day, during the year, they don't really talk a whole lot like Christians when that happens. So you see what I'm saying? But they all fit in and have a good time together. And they're all in the Christian family. And I think that's what happens to some people that get saved. They just sort of blend in for whatever reason that's generally what happens. And so when you go to these churches or meetings anywhere, that's usually what you see. Kind of pretty much the same stuff, which I call mediocrity or immaturity, or the Lord calls being lukewarm. But that's what we're talking about. It's just easier to do that. So generally the biggest change ever in their life was right after they got saved. And then they kind of melted back and went back to the way they were and just settled in. And I'm not saying they don't go to church and, and not are there. Uh, doing what they're supposed to do and giving what they're supposed to give that, that's fine uh, that's happening it's just that's what it is but you know the longer you go on the Lord and don't follow him the way he wants us to the way he directs us to the word of God the harder it gets to make the changes that God wants you to make in your life uh, when we first got saved uh, Lois and I we, we both smoked and not drank and did a lot of other stuff. And I was 30 when I got saved, I said, when I got saved, I got saved. Every bit of me got saved. And I started living for the Lord and he was working through my life. And one day the Lord said, you know, I think the Lord wants me to quit smoking. I said, I'll tell you what, if he told me to quit, I'd quit. <laughs> a week later, <laughs> Outside, I, I, that was it. Don't smoke anymore. And I confess to you that's one of the hardest things. And it, maybe it's a shame to say that. It's one of the hardest things my whole life, my whole life I've ever tried to do was stop smoking. I don't think I could have done it if I'd waited. If I'd have not stopped right then, I don't think I could have done it ever again. Have had it and I've talked to a lot of Christians. Now, if some of y'all smoking here, that's between you and the Lord, okay? I don't know anything about it. I'm just telling you, my experience is what God said to me. But I've had friends uh, in church and they smoke. Uh, they, they can't even imagine trying to quit now because they went through the same thing. They tried to quit when they were. It was hard. And that's generally when the greatest changes occur is at that time. So that's the best time. Don't ever give up if the Lord's speaking to you hard about making changes, which He will. It just gets harder the longer you're saved. Now, what that would indicate then, that during this process, that God's been working on your heart already, and you've been resisting whatever it happened to be, and the longer we resist, of course, the harder it gets. Until finally, uh, you don't have to resist. You just know what you would consider doing that. So the sooner, the better. Even if you've been saved 40 years, and God deals with your heart about stuff. And, and yes, he deals with my heart about stuff now. Sure he does. He always will. He's going to be dealing with us. So we still have to give it to the Lord. That's what this is about. It's learning to give it all to the Lord. And walk the path that he wants us to walk. So uh, immaturity is, is a hard thing. It's a bad thing. And eventually you just dry up spiritually. And I don't even know if you want to call it immaturity after that. It's just not going forward. There's no spiritual growth. There's nothing. And just like this, the uh, uh, Joe, the pastor read a while ago, it's either yes or no. It's either up or down. There is no halfway. That's what the Lord wants to get across to us in this. So then, uh, let's look at a little bit of maturity and then go on from there. Maturity, of course, is an ongoing process. That never, if, it, if it's a maturity, it's never going to stop. There may be some slowdowns, but if it's maturity in your Christian life, it's not going to stop. It, it doesn't stop. We reach a certain place. 
And I'm sorry to say I've seen this in ministry, uh, in, in ministers and ministries and churches a lot. It seems like once you reach a certain level, okay, you're there. That's it. I don't know that people sit out and say that, but that's what their life shows. And I have had some pastors uh, say, you know, I, I used to do this and grew and grew. And he said, finally, I began to understand these things, and I'm okay. Indicated to me that he was not going to need to grow anymore, that he had already reached full of knowledge. Of course, that's never going to happen. We know that. You know, some people feel like after they reach a, a certain number of years, uh, you know, that's as far as you need to go. You're 70, 80 years old. You've been serving the Lord all your life. Uh, you've been doing whatever you've been doing, and you just don't need to grow anymore. You've reached that, you've reached that stage. And that's really a shame when somebody like that, because ideally over the years, they've gained, they've gained some wisdom. But in Philippians chapter 3, it's the best, the best text on, on maturity and maturing that I know of. I know the Lord's spoken to me a lot through this. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through the first part of 15. Brethren, Paul speaking, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards a mark, <clears throat> pardon me, for the prize uh, of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, that's mature, be thus minded. And if anything, uh, we must be otherwise minded. God shall reveal even this to us. <clears throat> so we see here Paul, which is the best example that I can think of, human example of maturity and what would be happening. Uh, he's, he's never going to reach maturity on here. He's, he's going on that he'll apprehend. Keep on learning, keep learning. He's going on. He says, that's what we need to do. But he says more than that. He says he reaches. He's striving. He's making an effort. He's straining. And maturity, in your age, and just in your physical body, that ought to teach us what maturity is. Guys, it's hard, and it gets worse as it goes along. Until, the, until at the end it's as bad as it can get. And then you die and go to heaven and praise the Lord. Maturity is difficult physically. It's also difficult spiritually, maybe even more so uh, that it's difficult spiritually. I'm not sure yet. I haven't learned it all yet, so I'll find out. But we're never going to reach that full maturity. We're supposed to reach towards that all the time. Be working towards that. This, this applies to us. We're supposed to be working, straining. We're supposed to be pressing toward the mark. He doesn't just, Paul just doesn't leave it and drop it. When the Bible repeats something, the Holy Spirit's doing that, and it's for a reason. Because this needs to be stressed. Because it's a difficult thing to do. And God, the Lord gives us a lot of examples throughout the Word of God, especially in the New Testament, about this. We've got to keep it up. You never, you never reach a place where you can slow down. You do not do it. It's constant. Now, that turns a lot of people off. The fact that, that what they're going through here, they're trying to serve the Lord and trying to live for the Lord and doing what they know the Bible says to do and, and going on for God and want to want to do it and keep on and keep on and keep on. How do you do that? You don't do it, of course. The Holy Spirit's going to do it. If he doesn't give you the strength and the wisdom to do it, you'll never do it. I mean, just look back and I think the failures that I've had. Well, it was just because I got in charge and the Holy Spirit wasn't in charge, so I couldn't do it. So the Holy Spirit shows it to you. You have to confess it and get right with God. Get back on board. The Holy Spirit said, okay, now we can continue the journey. And that's what it's about. It's never, ever going to be easy. And, and that's why a lot of people don't go on. It's not easy. <clears throat> Generally, spiritual things Growth, especially, is not easy. And people, just the way we are, guys, people don't want to hurt. They don't want hard times. They don't want difficulties. That's the flesh, isn't it? So we got a choice to make then. We either go on with the Lord and the Spirit, or we do what the flesh wants us to do. And it's a lot easier to do what the flesh wants us to do. Unless, and I'll put this in there and then I'll go on. <clears throat> if you really say, you really love the Lord, you really want to go on with God, I guarantee you, if you don't do it, it's, he, he, you, your life in physically may be easier, but spiritually inside it's not going to be. It, it's going to be hard. 
You're never going to be happy. You're not going to have a good time. You can go ha 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 if you want to and go out and, and, and ride your boat around the lake, whatever. That's not the joy that God wants you. That's not the joy the Holy Spirit is going to give you. And if you're there, you're not going to have that joy. It's just a trade off. And that's what you're always going to come down to is it's which one, which one are you going to go? And he said, Paul said, the maturity would be thus minded. You'll go the way Paul's talking about here. That's what's going to happen. Then in Revelation chapter 30, Revelation chapter 30, there in, uh, I understand, brother, that you talk on uh, the seven churches in Revelation. Still going. Pardon me? Still going. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got to this one yet? Uh, Laodicea? Three. <laughs> no, not yet. Good. Then I can say anything. And nobody knows the difference until you get up here. There's, there's, in Revelation, there's so many different ways people look at things. So that's why, that's why I said that. So in Revelation chapter 3, we're going to see the danger now of the immaturity, of being mediocre, or as the Lord says, being lukewarm. In chapter 3, verse 15, I know thy work, talk to the church of Laodicea, I know thy work that thou art neither hot nor cold. That's the lukewarm we're talking about. We understand that. I know thy works are neither hot nor cold. I would that that were hot or cold. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art rich and miserable and poor and blind and naked. These poor people, they think they're fine. They've got to the place, they think it's okay. What, whatever they're doing is okay. That, that's where they've got to, that's what's happening here. And that's an example of probably, I'm going to say most of the churches in our country today, and maybe around the world, I don't know. But mediocre, immaturity, lukewarm, it, it all means halfway. It's like one halfway up a mountain. I'm a mountain climber, you go halfway up, come back down. It's just not going all the way. It's stopping before you reach the place that you're supposed to be. And for a mountain climber, that would be down be on top of the mountain. But these Christians here we see, they're satisfied with where they were. And satisfaction is probably the best tool that Satan has. He makes us satisfied with where we're at. So we won't go on. And that's exactly what these, these people are. They're satisfied with where they're at. They had a name of Christ, of a Christian name, without carrying the cross of Christ. They had a name of Christ with, without a cost of repentance that it takes to be that. They never paid the price for anything. They're the perfect script, description of lukewarm, hot or cold. A lukewarm Christian would be a spiritual zombie. You're dead on the inside. You might be alive on the outside for such a thing. Be alive on the outside, but dead on the inside. You're nothing. You're not growing. You're not hot or cold. You just don't care is what it comes down to. And that's probably the worst testimony of a Christian that I can ever say. They just don't care. It comes across to people. Apathetic. And people pick up on that. Talk about a bad testimony. That's one. So does this seem hard? What the, what the Lord says here in verse 17? I'll spew thee out of my mouth. That seems difficult. And, and, and the, bad, the language has seemed to be bad. The Lord used that language for a reason. To get our attention just how bad that this thing is. It's bad. He wants to get it. He wants nothing to do with that kind of Christianity. Not a thing. Difficult. Verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. This is all done, and we know why it's done. It's done out of love. Every bit of this is, he loves us. He doesn't want to hurt us. We've hurt him greatly. He can't overcome that. We don't want anything to do with it. And he says, enough. And he said, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Maybe, maybe, repentance will come out of that. That's the whole point of everything, is for that to happen. So he's not give up on us. He's working on us. But the great danger we see here of immaturity and lukewarmness is grieving the heart of God. That's the worst thing that a Christian can possibly do, is grieve the heart of God, causing him to have to punish us. He doesn't want to do that. He's not sitting back here waiting. <laughs> I know Paul, he'll, he'll blow this one. I'll give him that. He's not doing that. 
He said, I, I know him. He's going to have a hard time. I want him to have a hard time. He's on our side. He wants it to work out. It's what, it's what most, he wants to happen. But in the end, this part's up to us. So what does God want from us? Did he, did he leave us uh, any doubt here what he wanted? Now, he, he made it plain. He made it straightforward. I wish you were hot or cold. One of the two. I, I could go into a long thing here about the cold and the hot, but I'm not going to do that uh, for time's sake. You don't need to, I don't think. Cold is that he's using here. It says the pure water that used to come out of the mountains, it was pure, it was clean, it was refreshing. He's, God said, I wish you were cold. I wish you were pure. Lived a pure life for me. You could refresh these other people and live the way you're supposed to do. Or hot, one of the two, if you're hot, at least then you're fervent for God. You've got something. You've got some passion about God and what he wants for you. I want you to be cold. I want you to be pure and refreshing. Or I want you to be passionate and on fire for me. Either way, God gets glorified. And we're doing what God wants to do. So that's what he wants to happen. That's what he desires for us to have. These people to reach a spot where they weren't doing anything and didn't care that they weren't doing anything, didn't care about what the Lord thought, but just went ahead and lived the way they wanted to live, not realizing just exactly where they were. And he's making them realize where they are. And that's not a happy thing. It's not meant to be. It's a difficult thing. And it's got to be to get our attention. Now, we're going to suffer trials and tribulations as, as Christians. As Christians that live for God, God works in our life to carry us on to more maturity and it usually takes some hardship and some suffering. But there's also, uh, I don't want to call it suffering in, in the bad sense over here, it's punishment. If you're not obeying God and walking with God and you're going through a hard time, that, that's not trials and tribulations, that's punishment, chastisement. That's what that is, there's is a difference. So don't, don't get the, confused, the two confused. If you're going through a difficult time, if you're having a hard time, if there's difficulties there, is it because God's working in your life to purify you and make you cleaner? I guarantee you the Holy Spirit will let you know the difference. It's either going to be you're in sin or God wants you to grow more like Him. You'll know the difference when it happens and you'll know the appropriate action to take it because the Holy Spirit is going to see that happen in your life. Because he's working there. So God said, I want you one way or another. But whatever, whatever he says, whatever he does, when he's working your life to make you hot or cold, leave the consequences to him. Don't fight against it. He's doing what he needs to do in your life. So, just uh, briefly here, let's see some obstacles to maturity. And I'm sure that y'all probably know most of them, if not all of them. First, there's going to be cost. There's going to be some material cost. There's going to be some cost in time that you're going to have to give up. There's going to be some cost in effort that you're going to have to make to live for God, to read the Word of God, to pray. There's going to be cost in reaching maturity. These costs are obstacles to that. There are always going to be those obstacles there. Uh, there's going to be some comfort you may have to give up. You may not be able to live the lifestyle that you would prefer to live in order to do what God wants you to do. Let's say that's the case for everybody. You can have multi-billionaires that are, that are Christians going on with God. God uses them and bless them. That's fine. God works in our life differently to get us what we need to do. But there's going to be uh, some comfort to give up. Somehow, some way. Whether it's outside comfort or whether it's inside comfort. It's going to cost. Why? Because we're in the flesh and we're on this earth. It's going to happen that way. And people are afraid of that. And that's why a lot of preaching and teaching kind of sidestep that. And here's the next one is security. You're going to have to give up your security. Does that mean you're going to have to give up your 401ks? No, I'm not saying that. I don't even know what it means to own a 401k. But <laughs> besides, besides that, I listened to this financial guy on the radio in the morning. <laughs> He's a Christian financial guy. Man, I wish I'd have, I'd have heard him before I got saved make all that money. I'd be set pretty right now. I could be living on that money. <laughs> no, you can have your 401k. That's fine. That's not what he's talking about here. You're going to have to give up that security, that thing, those things that you count on for your security to give you comfort. And change that to the Lord, whatever it may be. It could be the poorest person, the richest person, make any difference. 
It's whatever you're looking to for security. That's going to have to go. That's a hard thing. In our country, in our culture, it's a hard thing uh, to get to that place because uh, there's so many Christians around you that are doing fine, they're doing great, uh, they're walking with the Lord. And they say, well, I can too. No, maybe not. Maybe not. There may be some, some security there. You're going to have to give up. And then one is, that doesn't seem big, <clears throat> but it's really prevalent, is uh, there's going to be some inconveniences in your life, not because you're in the flesh, but because you're not doing what God wants you to do. It's just, it's just that simple. That's why Jesus said, deny yourself and follow me. Boy, that deny yourself covers a lot of area. A lot. Anything you think of it's about. If the Christian doesn't get involved, if your Christian life doesn't involve some inconveniences now and then, then probably you're not moving forward in your Christian life. That goes the same, by the way, with trials. Different times, different, different times, different sizes. God's going to be working. If you want to go along with God, God, see, he's, he's got to work in our life to get us where we need to be, which is to look like him. He's got to do it because we're in the flesh. And no matter how much we love the Lord and how much we want to serve God and live for God, in fact, probably the more that we do, God will say, yes, I've got someone here I can mold. And that molding comes, yes, from suffering, from tribulation of some sort, at some time, in some amount along the way. And it's hard, it's hard to be honest between you and God about that. Lord, I do not want to suffer. But God, if that's what it takes, okay, do whatever you want. Have you ever told the Lord that? If you're really going to go with God, it's going to take you. You, you. you can't go around it. It's just if you want to go with God or not. If you want to be conformed to the image of Christ. And guys, it's easy. You don't have to be. That's between you and the Lord. And how you handled it and how you handled it is a different thing. But he's not going to force us and whip us. He's going to chastise us to go do better, not, no, I'll just get you because you're not doing that, and I want you to do it. Listen, if you're not in sin, you're not going to do that, but you're not going to go with God either. So, it's what kind of life do you want? And you may be fine. Uh, people won't know it. You won't be a good testimony. You won't have joy and peace in your, in your life if you're really a Christian. And when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, then it's going to come out. If it doesn't come out anywhere else, if the judgment seat of Christ is going to come out. A lot of that wood, hay, and stubble are those things that you did not want God to do to you. It's going to come out the judgment seat. And it's going to grieve the heart of Jesus. It does now. The fact that we're not prepared to say, yes, Lord, whatever you want. The very one that died for us, that suffered for us, go say, no, I don't want to do what you want me to do. I'll accept your salvation. But after that, no. What guy said, <clears throat> the cross is never comfortable or convenient. John chapter 6. <clears throat> John chapter 6. <clears throat> Jesus was preaching. And he got to the place where he's preaching about the body and the blood. That they're going to have to have you have you have to have the, the blood of Jesus Christ, drink the blood, to have His life in you, eat the flesh. And He was using this for a parable to the people to what it takes. Jesus has got to be in you, and He was telling the people that. And finally, He come to to uh, chapter verse six, sixty uh, in chapter six. Many therefore of His disciples, notice this, guys, His disciples, not not the Pharisees. Not that Jews didn't care about him, but those that he was teaching, they were following him. But many of his disciples, <clears throat> when they heard this, uh, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Whoa, this is hard. I don't know about all this. Then you go to verse 66. From that time, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So it, 
It happened even, even under Jesus' teaching, the very Son of God, the very one that died for them, even to him they left. And they turned away. It was too hard for them. Verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve that stayed, unto the twelve, will you go also away? Will you also go away? I don't think that's a rhetorical question. This is the ones that he picked out. And he asked, will you go away? I think that grieved the heart of Jesus when they left. So just think what it does. They're taking the easy way. In the way that's most accepted. Following the others, the last obstacle is the, I consider it the very worst, the last obstacle. And that's mixing carnal things and spiritual things together. That generally, what most lukewarmness and most immaturity revolve around those things. In Romans chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, and I'll just read those. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. And they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So here it is. Over and over and over, we're very plainly right here, guys. It's either, it's either flesh, uh, it's a spirit. One of the two, there it is. You can't have both ways. And what we want, we want both ways. Listen, if you live in a place in a third world country, I mean, there's nothing. I mean, I, have, I mean nothing. When I talk about a hard time, I'm talking about people who have nothing. If they don't get something to eat that day, they're going to go hungry. And if they don't get something to eat somehow, some way, the next day, they're going to go hungry. I know in, in the villages, uh, in Mexico, uh, in some of those villages, really, really, not all of them, they're really poor, but some of them are. And I, I saw people, they would go buy enough tortillas for the first meal, day of breakfast, for the meal of the day. That's all they could buy. If they didn't somehow, some way, get money, they didn't have tortillas for lunch. And so their whole existence was trying to get money for the next meal. Hopefully, they'd get money for the, for the whole next day, but not necessarily. So sometimes, the outward life is so difficult. How can you imagine anything better? Just let me get through this day is all I want. I just want enough for my children to eat. I'm happy. How do, how do you talk to people like that about giving up stuff for the Lord? They already got it bad. As a consequence, there's many people in poverty-stricken countries they get saved because they know hardship. And they may even think, it can't be as hard as what I'm going through now. It happens. So we don't have it like that. So it's difficult. It's more difficult for us. Yes, it's more difficult for us. It's got everything to live the life God wants us to live. Prosperity is a killer to the Christian life. That's a shame to say that. It doesn't have to be. It's obviously not for everybody, but generally speaking, in our culture, in our churches, all that's going on, we're too prosperous. Why? Because we're in the flesh, and we do not put God first. Lord, your will over all this, over this building, this land, my house, anything you can think of, Lord, your will, whatever you want. I don't want to lose this, Lord, but if you want me to, okay. Can you say that and really honestly believe it? That's what we're talking about. Nothing. God's everything. Nothing else counts. Just Him. Then, okay, you go along. God can use those kind of people. God can use that kind of church. And we haven't got them enough in this country. I'm not, not even going to get into what's going on now. I could start there and go for a long time. 
but no. But the word work, we Christians are the reason. God judges the country on his people. Like in Israel, he's doing it on, in America too. His people, us, Christians. It's hard to go on with God. God wants us and he'll get us there. He'll give us the wisdom, he'll give us the power, he'll give us the way to do it if we just let him do it. Get out of the way and let him do what he wants to do. You mix both of them and it's not going to work. It's going to come out where you end up like these people. Lukewarm, not have nothing. So it's, you can't mix those things up. But let me end on a good note. If it's not enough to say that, that what we want from God is a good note, that's a good thing in the end. But okay, let's, let's end on a good note. That's right. Praise God. He never puts a limit, for instance, on the number of times we fail. We can fail. I don't, you can't count it. God has yet to put a limit on us. He doesn't reach a spot where he said, if you fail, one, you did that one too often. You're done. Never. If we're ready to repent, repent he's ready to, to forgive and use us and go on and grow us. But we never, never, he never puts a limit on the number of times we can fail. Praise God. Think of Abraham. He failed. Moses, he failed quite a lot. <laughs> David, honest David wrote Psalms that we know he failed a lot because he put it in there. Jacob, I don't know whether he ever been it out right yet. He did. He failed. And Peter, <laughs> he's easy. By the way, I always identify with Peter. And, and loud mouth, get himself in trouble. That's, that's Peter. God never gave up on him. He never limits us. In our failures. Praise God for that. He never puts a limit <clears throat> on our age. Psalm 71, verse 18. Now also, when I am old and gray headed, O God, forsake me not, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. I'm old, Lord. Use me. Use me. I'm old. Caleb was 85. Now, if I was going to live a long time, I'd want his help. He went to war in 85 against everybody. So, in fact, actually, according to this too, the older we get, the more use we ought to be to God. Because ideally, as Christians, we've been through some things, we've made some mistakes, we've failed, God, we've repented, we've gained some wisdom, we've trusted God in hard times, we've worked for God all those years. Guys, older people ought to have something to share with younger people. That's a shame if they don't. And the shame is, in many churches, that's the case. If they do have anything, they're not sharing it with anybody that doesn't know it. But God, He never puts a limit. Well, how many times we can fail, he never puts a limit on our age. He wants to use us to the very, very end. And as I get older and look back, in the, I've been saved 43 years, uh, 44 years, and I look back, and when I got saved, I went out to serve the Lord. And I failed a lot in doing that. And I look back and I see a lot of places that I could have done better for the Lord than not. And so as I get to these, these end years, I said, Lord, we got to hurry up. I need to get some more that. So I mean, some gold and silver and money in here. My, my wood hay and stubble pile is too big. I need, I need the height of this pile over here. God, I, I, I want to do what you want me to do. And I sure do want to stand before you where you can say, well done, that good and faithful servant. That becomes more real now than it did when I was 30. It may not be happy. Should be the case, I'm sure that's the way it is. God will use us when we get old. Praise the Lord. I can still be used for right now anyway. For however long. And he never puts a limit on how much we know. Nobody is ever too dumb to serve the Lord. He never, ever puts a limit on us. He wants to use anybody and everybody, and he will. And will they? So God's looking at us and we have all this stuff we've been going through, and he does all of this for us. 
no matter what. How many times we fail, how old we are, how little we know, who we are, what we are, none of that means anything. The only thing that counts is to be able to say, yes, Lord, I walked the path that you wanted me to walk on the way to heaven. That's what counts. God, did I do what you wanted me to do? Yes. Revelation chapter 20, and that's the last verse on there. Revelation chapter 20. The Lord speaking. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, I've always heard when I was younger, I always heard this verse in one way. For lost people to be saved. That's fine. But in the context, this is the church he's talking to. And he's saying, hey church, Laodicea, I want, I want to come in. Will you let me in? Will you let me come in and fellowship with you? Now just all of what he said here about that church. Sorry, no good, lukewarm church. And nobody want to walk into you think he's saying, please let me come in and fellowship with you. And that's the kind of God I want to serve. The point is, is he here fellowship? Only if you are letting him work in your life the way he wants to. Yes, Lord, I'll walk the path that you want me to walk. Irregardless of the cost. What this church does depends on that, guys. Depends on that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blessings you give us. God, you just outdo yourself. Thank you for that, Lord. God, thank you that you never, ever give up on us, God. You continually forgive us and bless us. And you do to us, Father. Thank you for that. God, I pray that you work with hearts this morning. God, as we leave here through the next week, the Lord, the Holy Spirit will have the freedom to do in our life exactly what He wants to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Stand together, turn to M 461, he leadeth me. Number 461.
thank you, Heavenly Father, that you do lead us. That you do lead us in paths of righteousness. And, and walk with us that we can grow in ways that please you. Lord, we ask your blessing in the message we've heard. Ask your presence as we go home from this place. In the week ahead, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.